And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Joe McCord. Welcome to our first convention. I want to thank all of you for being here, many of you for being with us for the, uh, the last many, many months since uh, ribbon cutting took place. I know a few of you have probably not missed a single event. You've probably heard me speak more times than you really wanted to, um, sometimes literally blinding you with science. Today I'm going to talk to um, not only those of you who have been to many events, but also to those of you for whom this may be the first event. What I would like eventually to, to teach all of you is the science that I think every distributor should know. This is a complicated product that you're selling, that you're representing. And the science behind it is complicated, and I, nobody knows that better than, than me. Um, but it's also something I've, I firmly believe you can get your arms around, and that I think every one of you can do justice to presenting this product, ProTandem, for what it is scientifically. So I'm going to review all seven of the publications upon which this science rests and upon which this product rests. When I came into this uh, room this morning, while it was being set up, I looked up and I noticed these banners uh, on your left. And there's a banner for every publication on ProTandem from the first one in 2006 to the seventh one uh, earlier this year. I didn't know they were going to be there, but it's useful for me to have them because, <laughs> because there are elements in each of those seven publications that I would like for you eventually to have at your fingertips. I get many, many requests from, from distributors saying, I encountered, maybe it's a physician, Maybe it's somebody who is knowledgeable in science. And I tried to tell them about ProTandem, and they, you know, they took a quick look at the science, and they said, well, this is all done in cells, or this is all done in mice. Well, I want you to know exactly what each paper was done in. One important, the, probably the most important paper was done in cells, in tissue culture, human cells, by the way. But one of the papers, the very first one, was a human clinical trial. It wasn't done in mice or rats or cells. It was done in living humans. Several of the other extremely important papers were done in animals. And I want you to know what the message is from each of those. I'm going to begin um, with kind of a review of what oxidative stress is. And we now know ProTandem does more than just deal with oxidative stress to remedy that situation. It involves not just superoxide dismutase and catalase, the first two enzymes we focused on, but as I told you at Elite Academy last October, we now know that ProTandem modulates more than 600 genes. In fact, at higher doses, not used in humans, as many as 4,000 genes can be affected out of a total of 25,000 genes that we have. This is not a minor little tweak. This is a major readjustment of everything that makes you who you are and what you are. So let's begin by looking at this question. What is oxidative stress? Where do oxidants and free radicals come from? And a question that, believe it or not, some people don't know the answer to, why should we worry about oxidative stress? 
It happens to everybody as you get older. Maybe it's just a part of life that we can't do anything about. Well, this is the number of papers published in the peer-reviewed scientific literature since um, about 1960, when there were essentially zero. And in 1970, there were about three or four because superoxide dismutase had been discovered. And we began to talk about what is oxidative stress. It's now been um, 41 years since that discovery. And the total number of papers now available in the medical literature is more than 86,000. And you can see the growth rate of these papers. And that should be kind of reminiscent of what Carrie just showed you, uh, because this company is taking a similar exponential growth pattern. And this is the science that underlies everything that we stand for and everything that this product was designed for. The bottom line here is that scientists do worry about oxidative stress. This is a big slice, a significant slice of the total scientific endeavors going on in this country and around the world. So this is not minimal. This is not something tucked away in one corner. This is mainstream. What is oxidative stress from a cellular point of view? Every cell in your body contains these little structures known as mitochondria. They're the engines that burn our food and create the energy that drives everything we are and everything that we do. It drives the thoughts that you think in your brain. It drives the muscles that enable you to walk and run. And in, <clears throat> in principle, the mitochondrion is not very different from the internal combustion engine that drives your automobile. It takes in food, in its case, gasoline. It takes in oxygen. It burns that fuel. And it produces energy in a useful form. One of the things that mitochondria have in common with internal combustion engines is that they are not 100% efficient. They're byproducts. Ideally, we'd like for all of that fuel to appear as water vapor and carbon dioxide. And in a perfectly designed engine, that would be the case. We haven't built a perfectly designed engine yet. Your car produces all kinds of byproducts, and your cells produce some of the very same byproducts. Specifically, one of them is this free radical, the superoxide radical. It's called superoxide because it's like oxygen, only it's super. Oxygen is what supports the combustion process. This is even more reactive than oxygen. It's really super oxygen. It's a very potent oxidizing species. It's toxic to cells. It's toxic to the parts of your car that produce it. Your cars have catalytic converters to deal with this toxic byproduct, and your cells also have catalytic converters. Those catalytic converters are called enzymes. They're called, in some cases, antioxidant enzymes, such as superoxide dismutase and catalase. They serve exactly the same function as catalytic converters on your automobiles. What happens if you don't scavenge, take care of, convert these reactive products? They can do a number of very damaging things to biological systems. They can oxidize proteins. And the example I've shown here is an antioxidant enzyme itself called PON1, protects against atherosclerosis. Very important enzyme. It's inactivated by oxidative stress. And so if you have high levels of oxidative stress, the levels of PON1 circulating in your plasma go down. They go down in many, many diseases, in rheumatoid arthritis, in multiple sclerosis, in diabetics, in pa patients with autoimmune diseases. It's a marker of what's going wrong in this system within your body. Too many oxidants are being produced. They're damaging proteins and enzymes. They can also damage 
fat, lipid molecules. And when that happens, it produces something you've probably heard about, T-bars. T-bars is an acronym, but it measures oxidized polyunsaturated fatty acids. Polyunsaturated fatty acids are not bad. They're essential for life. Uh, every, every food you eat has some polyunsaturated fatty acids. You use it to synthesize your own cell membranes. But this free radical can damage that biological family of molecules as well. So it can damage proteins, can damage lipids, can also damage DNA. Another category of biological molecules, and everybody knows DNA is important. That's what constitutes your genes. It's what makes each of us different. It's what gives your children characteristics that they inherited from you. Sometimes good, sometimes bad, but that's the way that goes. The same free radical can damage DNA. Again, not a good thing. So here's a third category of biological molecules that can be damaged by DNA. Damaged DNA is called mutated DNA. And the right mutations in the right genes can lead to cancer, one of the biggest health problems we face. Again, the result of free radical attack on our DNA. And the free radicals can also signal events in our bodies. Some of these are not always damaging, and in the right place at the right time, they're good. Fibrosis is formation of scar tissue. So if you cut yourself, you want that wound to heal as quickly as possible. And fibrosis helps that to come about. However, if your heart becomes fibrotic, it's medically known as heart failure. The pump quits working at its normal output. Not good. Apoptosis is actually programmed cell death. It's a way by which cells can die. At times, that's good. When you're a, an embryo, this process of apoptosis actually is what carves out your fingers from what looks originally like mittens. And as the fetus develops, everything goes normally and you develop hands and fingers as you should. So apoptosis is not a bad thing in the right place. But if the cells in your heart undergo apoptosis, it's not a good thing. The cells in your brain undergo apoptosis and you may be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So all of these things require balance. Some of them are universally bad. Some are bad only in the, when the amount is incorrect. This slide was the result of work that, that took place throughout that previous graph that I showed you in the last 40 years. And so this was pretty much in place well before protandum came along. We knew all of this happened. We knew what free radicals do that damages our bodies. And it was only when I looked at this within the last week and decided to put this very early slide in here to give you perspective, to give you a summary, that I realized that those seven papers I'm going to be talking about, represented by those banners on the wall, have addressed every part of this damage that's done by protanum. Specifically, paper number six over there, published in 2010, showed that protandum prevents that loss of this antioxidant enzyme, PON1. Papers number one, number six, and number seven showed that protandum prevents this damage to lipids, to polyunsaturated fatty acids in our body that give rise to T-bars. Papers number three and five showed that protandum prevents damage to DNA. In fact, those papers showed that protandum supplementation could prevent skin cancers in the mice that were used in that study. Papers four and six showed that protandum can prevent fibrosis, scar tissue, scar tissue that can cause a heart to go into failure. Paper number four showed that protandum can prevent 
apoptosis or programmed cell death. And you'll notice that in many of these things, multiple papers have addressed the same issue. And there's method to that. I think some people look at the, the specific disease models that have been studied in these papers, and they, it may look like a random selection. You know, Why are we looking at drug-induced pulmonary hypertension? Why are we looking at uh, intimal hyperplasia in veins that are used to bypass clogged arteries. It's because it's these same five processes that are involved in free radical damage, oxidative stress-induced damage throughout the body. What protects us from oxidative stress is not one antioxidant enzyme or even two, even though that's what we focused on in paper number one. It's an entire system of antioxidant enzymes. And here we see a tiny corner of that system. This, the, the enzymes are shown in blue on this sequence of reactions. The bad products are shown in red, and the detoxified products or the antioxidant products that help get rid of the bad stuff is shown in green. It's the blue enzymes that make these reactions occur. The first paper really focused only on that little part. It looked at the reactions catalyzed by acidine catalase. A second paper, which is one of the very important ones, showed that the enzymes involved in making glutathione, you hear a lot about glutathione in this industry, are also upregulated by protandum, allowing our bodies, our cells, our individual cells to make more glutathione, not because the precursors or this, the raw materials to make glutathione are limiting, sometimes they are, more often, it's the enzymes. It's the things encoded by your genes, upregulated by protandum, that allow you to make more of these things. Protandum contains five phytochemicals. And again, the structures are not important to memorize, so you'll be relieved at that. But they come from five different plants. Uh, all of these plants have a long, long history in traditional medicine. People didn't know how they worked, but for centuries they knew they do work. What they didn't know was that they are regulators of a protein called NERF2 and activators of NERF2. And that's the mechanism whereby more than 500 of, of your most protective genes are regulated by these simple, believe it or not, chemicals produced by humble little plants that have been recognized in India and China uh, for centuries and centuries. They activate what's called the master regulator of stress-related responses of antioxidant enzymes. How does protandum activate NERF2? And you hear a lot about NERF2. You're going to hear even more about NERF2 um, as time goes on. How does protandum activate NERF2 in a cell? This is a cartoon that illustrates that. This purple shape in the upper right corner of this slide represents one of those five chemicals from plants, from medicinal plants. And so as protandum approaches a cell, the cell actually has receptors on its surface. And my analogy here is this is like if the cell is your house, protandum just stepped onto your front porch. And it rings your doorbell when that happens. And that causes a change inside your house. You hear the, the chimes or the bell. And you know something has just happened that may change events within your house. In this case, an enzyme on the inside of that cellular house called a kinase has been activated, signified by turning yellow. Well, the business of that kinase is to put phosphate groups to chemically modify a handful of molecules that it knows how to modify. One of those is that little red oval labeled NERF2. NERF2 is being held in the cytosol, outside the nucleus where the, where the DNA resides. 
by this other larger protein called KEEP1. So the activated kinase now chemically modifies NERF2, and you can see that little yellow P that's been added. That's a phosphate group. So it's chemically changed NERF2. And the protein that's holding on to NERF2 now sees this thing has changed its shape. It doesn't fit my grasp quite as well. It releases that NERF2. So it's now free to diffuse around the cell. And it's small enough, it can actually enter the nucleus, which is the vault. It's where all the plans, the blueprints, for everything you are reside in the form of DNA. So this activated NERF2 now has access to all of those blueprints and it binds to specific genes within there. Out of 25,000, at least five or 600 bind activated NERF2, and the result is those genes are turned on. Each of those genes has a switch, like a dimmer switch on the lights in your house. NERF2 simply turns that knob. Those genes express what they encode, the, the products, designated by the blueprint of each and every of, of those genes is now produced. And among those products are antioxidant enzymes, anti-inflammatory enzymes, antifibrotic enzymes, all kinds of stress-related genes that help cells, especially when they're in chemical stress, when they're in oxidative stress. It helps bring things back into balance and to provide a normalizing influence <clears throat> on those cells. We can visualize this microscopically. The upper uh, three panels show control cells, cells without protandum. And here, again, I won't go into a lot of detail, but we can stain NERF2, and it stains red in this slide. It's a flu fluorescent red stain for NERF2. We can also stain the nuclei of those cells. It's staining the DNA. And if you merge those two, you get what you see in the upper right. And it may be a little hard to see in this lighting, but what you see, if you look carefully at that, is the nuclei are green, and the NERF2 is red surrounding the nuclei. nuclei. It's not where the DNA is. If we treat those same cells with protandum and now stain the NERF2 and stain the DNA in the nucleus and now superimpose the red stain and the green stain, what you see is the lower right figure. Everything looks yellow, and that's because if you add red light and green light together, your, what your eye sees is yellow. This proves to scientists looking through this microscope that protandum treatment caused the nerf to go from its location outside the nucleus in the upper row to exactly where the DNA is. That is, the NERF2 has moved into the nucleus, and that's where it can regulate those genes, turn up all of those uh, processes. The first paper published in 2006, I've condensed into one or two sentences for you here. This is really what you, you don't need to know about everything in that paper, but you do need to know this. After 30 days of supplementation, T-bars, which is oxidized lipids, declined by an average of 40%, and the age-dependent increase was eliminated. By 120 days, SOD and catalase had increased by 30%, 54% in the red cells, respectively. That's very significant. You have all seen this figure. This shows what T-bars looks like in a population of varying age. There's a lot of scatter. We're not all the same at age 40 or 50 or 60. Some of us are in great shape. Some of us are already suffering from diseases associated with aging. If you draw a linear regression line, the line through those scattered dots, you can see that there's a relentless progression as we, you go from 20 to 80, your T-bars averages go up and up and up. If you look at people in this group, 
who were taking conventional so-called antioxidant supplements that many of us took for decades. Those are the points that turn from red to blue. So some of these people were taking about half a gram of vitamin C every day, about 400 units of vitamin E. And you might think they would have been better off than their colleagues who weren't taking those, but they weren't. Those blue dots, in fact, if you draw a linear regression line, fall on a line with an even steeper slope. And you've heard a lot in Time and Newsweek and on the evening news, studies that show traditional antioxidants, vitamins, antioxidant vitamins, don't always help. Sometimes they can even make things worse. Well, indeed, that's true. And our study, <coughs> our study, <coughs> excuse me, confirmed what many scientists had known and had been publishing for years, that sometimes traditional antioxidants can help, often they do nothing, and occasionally they can make things worse. What happens when these same people, whether they were taking traditional antioxidants or not, took Pertandem for 30 days? This is what you saw. <clears throat> And if you get rid of the before data and just look at the after, this is what's mean by the age-dependent increase has gone completely. That line is now flat from 20 to 80. And the 80-year-olds have no more evidence of oxidative stress than the 20, the 21, the 23-year-olds in this study. Now, we have to be careful in the terms that we use here. If you looked at the 80-year-old after a month, you could still tell that was the 80-year-old, okay? It did not reverse the aging process. It didn't reverse everything about it. But it did stop one of the biochemical markers associated with aging. Is that significant? I, I think it is. And I think all of you probably think it is. <clears throat> it doesn't turn back the clock throughout the month the three months that these people were taking Protandum, their clocks went around every day, 24 hours worth, just like the rest of us. Chronologically, they were still 80 years old. Biochemically, they were in better shape. This um, <clears throat> shows, again, that Protandum eliminated that age-dependent increase. Another important thing, the two antioxidant enzymes we were focused on initially showed distinct elevations, increases, significant increases. And that accounts for what happened with T-bars. It was because of the contribution of those enzymes that this oxidation uh, was held in check. A lot of people ask then, and they still ask, you know, what's T-bars got to do with, with living a long, healthy life? They may say, I ask my doctor, to check my T-bars, and he'd never even heard of T-bars. And that's not unusual. T-bars is used in research labs, and doctors, except for a few, don't spend time in research labs. They spend time taking care of their patients, trying to remember what they learned in medical school 30 years ago. <laughs> well, I, I don't mean that as a slam. That's That's... <laughs> That's their job, and thank goodness that they're, they're doing it. But they don't know what goes on in research labs, and they don't know if T-bars is relevant or not. This is a paper that, uh, there, there are many papers, there are more than 8,000 papers that have measured T-bars, and they measure it for a reason. It tells those investigators something important. The title of this, Serum Levels of T-bars, Thiobarbituric Acid Reactive Substances, predict cardiovascular events in patients with stable coronary artery disease. This is a large segment of the elderly population that would qualify for this, stable coronary artery disease. And their levels of T-bars, exactly what we measured and what you saw decline, predicts cardiovascular events. Cardiovascular events are blood clots in arteries. They're angina attacks due to occluded arteries that are letting only 10% of the normal amount of blood through. They're not good things. They're things that can bring you to your knees. They're things that can cause you to drop dead. They're things that can cause recurrent 
chronic chest pain. And all of us have family members who have suffered um, with coronary artery disease and with cardiovascular events. T-bars was a better predictor of cardiovascular events than cholesterol levels. All right, if you go to your doctor, I'll guarantee 100%. He knows what cholesterol is. But many of those physicians don't know that T-bars is a better indicator of what's going to happen to your heart than cholesterol is. This paper is probably the most important paper, 2008, important to me at least, because it delineated what we know about NERF2 activation, the, the data I just showed you. Protandum-mediated heme oxygenase, HO1 induction, that's an, anti, an important antioxidant enzyme, involved the presence of antioxidant response element sites. You don't have to remember this part. Uh, and nuclear translocation of the transcription factor NERF2. Remember when the green and the red made yellow? That's what enabled this statement to be made. Protandum caused NERF2 to move into the nucleus where it could activate those genes. It tells us precisely what the mechanism of action of this is. It's not hand-waving. It's not, if you take this, you'll probably feel better. You know, the person three doors down took it, and now they can run hurdles or do whatever. It's not anecdotal. It's not hearsay. It's hard documented science. This is the paper that showed the synergy. The synergy of protandum caught us all by surprise. It was far more than we hoped for. You might say, why'd you put five ingredients in protandum? Why not just pick the best one? Our bodies don't let those ingredients in. Our guts keep out most of those ingredients. So you can get low concentrations of each of the five, but not high concentrations. No matter how much you take, you're limited to a low circulating amount. What this slide shows is if you look at the individual contributions of those five ingredients, control is nothing. Ashwagandha is the first ingredient, essentially nothing by itself. Bacopa, nothing. Green tea, that's actually negative a little bit by itself. Silymarin, okay, something there. And curcumin, also negative. You put those all together and you get the red bar on the right. That's what synergy is. A lot of people may look at the, they may look at the label. <clears throat> and they may say, well, I've heard of several of these things and I've been taking curcumin for the last three years, why do I need to take Protandum, which may be more expensive than my bottle of curcumin? This is the reason. You can't do it with curcumin alone. You can't do it with any two of those. All five of those contribute to this powerful synergy in this particular endpoint 18 times more than we expected to see by the sum of these individual low concentrations of the ingredients better than the sum of the parts. So that second paper showed that the five ingredients produce this huge synergy, that each ingredient acts at a low and pharmacologically attainable dose. Sometimes there are papers published showing that in a Petri dish, curcumin can do this great thing. Well, your body is not a Petri dish. For your body to use curcumin, you have to take the curcumin capsule and it would have to be absorbed and transported through your body. That's what's limited. It doesn't happen. A little bit of curcumin gets in, not much. Protandum works because the five ingredients, it's okay if they're at low concentrations. In fact, it's better that they're at low concentrations because some of them have toxic effects at high concentration. Five things at low concentration Working together, amplifying the NERF2 activation is what does the trick. And specific ratios are important. So there's synergy, there's low-dose effectiveness, and there's a specific ratio of these five ingredients. This paper also showed that glutathione is dramatically increased nearly fourfold by treating cells with protandum. And it's not because protandum contains the precursors you need to make glutathione, it doesn't. 
How's it working? It's causing the enzymes that make glutathione to be produced. That's the part that's rate limiting. The mechanisms are very different. This shows um, how cysteine, one of the key amino acids in glutathione, gets into your cell. And the, the enzyme shown there in blue, glutathione synthase, is upregulated by protanum. So you can make GSH, glutathione, an important antioxidant protectant in your cells. But amazingly, what limits the amount of glutathione most cells can make is not the amount of cysteine that's circulating through your body. There's a little pro protein there called XC minus, not a catchy name. And it's a turnstile protein. If your cell is like um, your local branch bank, it may have a revolving door to get into that bank. And this protein lets cysteine get in one side of that revolving door, but only if another molecule, glutamate, is coming out the other side of that revolving door. So it's like a heavy door that it takes two people to push to get one in and one out. That's one of the most powerfully upregulated genes by protandum. And that's the part of this whole cysteine, uh, sorry, of this whole glutathione synthetic pathway that's limiting, that's the slow point. You may have cysteine lined up outside the bank waiting to get through. If you don't have a, a working door or enough doors in that bank, no matter how much cysteine is waiting outside, it's not gonna happen, All right? So making glutathione is not getting more cysteine into your body or acetylcysteine or any precursor. It's about upregulating those enzymes that can put it together and make it for you. This paper is one of two, the third paper, that looked at this standard skin cancer model studied by scientists in a laboratory. It's done in mice, and it involves the application of two chemicals to the skin of the mouse. The first causes mutations, damage to the DNA by free radical mechanisms. And the second chemical is a tumor promoter. Cancer, fortunately, is a multi-step process. If, if cancer resulted from a single mutation, we would probably all be dead long ago from cancer. So cancer takes a series of mutations in a, in a specific set of genes to cause your cells to lose control. They lose the constraints. It's actually easy for a cell to eat food and divide. The hard part is for your body to keep your cells from doing that day in and day out. Many of us in this room don't weigh any more than we weighed a year ago, even though we've eaten a ton of food in the interim. And that's a good thing, because if all that, if every cell in your body had unrestricted ability to divide and divide and divide, we would all fill this auditorium individually. So, so it's much more difficult to keep your cells in control than to let them just proliferate um, ad nauseum. And so cancer happens when those constraints are broken, when your body, can, when your genes can no longer keep a cell from dividing and dividing and dividing. So once a cell breaks those constraints, it is medically a cancer and it will grow until it consumes you. This paper concluded overall, the induction of antioxidant enzymes by protandum may serve as a practical and potent approach for cancer prevention. A follow-up paper about a year later looked further into the mechanism and showed two of the, the specific genes that are regulated uh, by Protandum. One is the suppression. Protandum, some genes are turned down, and p53 is one of them. And manganese SOD, that's a mitochondrial SOD, was induced, was turned up. And it was those modulations of those two genes may play an important role in the tumor suppressive activity of protandum. What are the data shown in that paper? Those two papers. <clears throat> There were two groups of mice, 
And the first group got a regular mouse chow diet. It's what Purina makes and what mice eat. And it's balanced, it's a healthy diet. When they were treated with the two chemicals at high doses that cause skin cancer, that group of 15 mice shown here in the yellow bar got cancer, 100% of them, all 15 mice developed cancers. Many of them developed, probably all of them developed more than one. The number of cancers per mouse, 6.3. The total number of cancers in that group of mice, 94. The sep second group of mice treated identically except their mouse chow had protandum added at a dose calculated to be equivalent to what most of you in this room are taking, one caplet a day for a human, same adjusted dose for a mouse. And look at the second group, 15 mice. This time, a third of them developed no tumors at all. And if you look at the total number of tumors in this group compared to the other, it's 57% lower, only 40 as opposed to 94. So the cancer incidence was reduced by 33%, the multiplicity, the number of cancer, individual cancers, reduced by 57%. This was a remarkable study uh, described in these two papers. This is paper number six, published last year. Um, Virginia Commonwealth University, a very complicated model but one that resonates with what you heard earlier this afternoon. This is a conclusion from the, from the abstract. Protandum prevented fibrosis and capillary loss and preserved heart function, in this case, right ventricular function, right side of the heart in this particular model. How did it do that? It prevented heart fibrosis. I told you protandum turns down some genes and turns up others. There are genes that signal the fibrotic process, formation of scar tissue. And again, if you have a cut, it's important that you can heal that cut. But if your heart turns to scar tissue, you're in big, big trouble. The graph on the left shows the amount of fibrosis in the hearts of these animals. They were treated with, here, a, a chemical that caused pulmonary hypertension. That's also a word you heard earlier this afternoon. Pulmonary hypertension puts a strain on the right side of the heart. It pumps the blood to the lungs to get reoxygenated back to the heart. And the left side then pumps that reoxygenated blood to every part of your body. So look at the, the amount of fibrosis. How do, you, how do scientists measure fibrosis? These two pictures at the bottom, again, I think that's hard to see on the big screen. Maybe on the either side it's more clear. The picture on the right shows a fibrotic heart, and you can see areas that stained kind of a bright blue scattered among the pink tissue of the heart. A normal heart is shown on the left, and you don't see those areas of blue. So th there's a way of microscopically staining the tissue. You can tell how much of that heart has turned to fibrosis. Look at the graph on the left. The control heart has very little fibrosis, that small blue bar. The, the hearts that had chemically induced pulmonary hypertension had about four times as much fibrosis, the red bar. Animals that were treated exactly the same way except with the addition of protandum. And you can see the red bar was dramatically reduced, significantly reduced to the green bar. So fibrosis was prevented. We, in this case, measured a specific gene product. This is a protein that signals your body to create scar tissue. You can see in the control, the healthy animals, a very small bar. The ones with pulmonary hypertension, a lot of signal telling the cells to become fibrotic, to create scar tissue. And you can see it largely blocked in the animals that were treated with protandum. Protandum prevented dilatation of the heart. What does that mean? That means enlarged heart. It's not good when your heart 
enlarges. You might think a big heart could pump more blood. Not so. It can't develop the pressure because the contractility is not there around that small space. The hearts from these animals, the control hearts, you can see that blue bar rec represents the diameter of the right ventricle, the pumping part of the, the heart that sends the blood to the lungs. In the ones that had pulmonary hypertension, the diameter was twice as great. The heart was enlarged to twice its normal size. And you can see a significant reduction in the protandum treated animals. If you look at the number of apoptotic cells, dead cells in these hearts, the, control, the healthy control animals had measurable apoptotic cells. The ones with pulmonary hypertension uh, many more times the dead cells, and it looks like I forgot to put the, the green bar on that chart, but it's there, it's just reduced to zero. There weren't any dead cells in the animals that had protandum supplemented diets. This is a measure of how well the heart pumps. It's cardiac output. It's blood, milliliters per minute of blood that that heart pumps. And so if someone goes into heart failure, it means the pump isn't working. So a normal, healthy rat heart can pump 60 milliliters, a couple of ounces of blood every minute. The ones with pulmonary hypertension, that was reduced by about 40%. And then the protandum treated animals, you can see it's restored almost to the normal pulmonary uh, cardiac output. This paper I didn't, um, I didn't feature in a, an elite academy, but it's an important paper. It's a mouse model of another disease. And you might say, why Duchenne muscular dystrophy? There are only about 3,000 boys in the United States of America that have DMD, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's a gen genetic disease that only affects males. Muscles waste, they turn to scar tissue they become fibrotic. So again, this is the recurrent theme you see in different models, different diseases, same mechanism in part. And what was seen here that after six months on protandum, these mice that have been engineered to have exactly the same gene defect that these boys, <clears throat> boys with DM, DMD have, they showed T-bars, lipid oxidation reduced by 48%. Does that sound familiar? The humans had a 40% reduction. Osteopontin was reduced by 57%. The previous VCU's heart study also showed osteopontin reduced. That's the trigger, the message for scar tissue. And the MRI signal, magnetic resonance imaging, if you have a boy with DMD and you do an MRI, you can see changes in the muscle. And I'm going to be brief here. T-bars went down, osteopontin went up. Both of those were decreased in the protandum-treated animals. And if you look at an MRI on a mouse, which is a difficult thing to do, um, these mice weigh about 20 grams, and the MRI machine was a tiny little MRI machine that probably cost twice as much as the big one that you go through. <clears throat> but here's what the pictures look like on a mouse that has mus muscular dystrophy. You can see those areas in the, <clears throat> in the yellow circles. That's simply abnormal regions of a muscle. The muscle should be uniform. This should look like a slice of ham because that's exactly what it is. This is an image through the thigh muscle of a mouse. And <clears throat> you can see those anomalous re regions. And these are protandum treated mice. And you can see those bright white, white spots have virtually disappeared. It really does look like a nice appetizing slice of ham, mouse ham, <laughs> on the right. But the important thing, if you have muscular dystrophy, you don't want those anomalous regions. You want to see clean-looking, normal-looking muscle. And it was reduced by 38%. Finally, this last paper, one I talked about at the last Elite Academy from Ohio State. And <clears throat> I realize you, some of you weren't there, but I'll summarize this one very briefly. 
uh, protana blocks intimal hyperplasia. What is that? It's the thickening of a vessel wall. And this is in veins that are used to bypass clogged arteries in the heart. If you know someone who's had bypass surgery, the bypass means they take a vein out of your leg, they use it to bypass, to put new plumbing around your heart. Um, this study increased the antioxidant enzymes, decreased levels of superoxide, decreased lipid peroxidation. What does intimal hyperplasia look like? This would be a cross-section through a healthy vein or a healthy artery. And it has the lumen, the pink spot in the middle is where the blood goes through. It's like the opening in a pipe. The vessel is composed of several layers. The innermost kind of yellow layer is labeled intima. And when you have intimal hyperplasia, it just means intimal overgrowth or thickening, you can see that that would partially occlude that pipe. <clears throat> it's not a good thing. And in real vessels, you can see the upper one is a freshly isolated vein from the leg that's going to be used to bypass the artery. The lower picture is that artery that's been subject, uh, sorry, that vein that's been subjected to oxidative stress. And you can see the wall has thickened, the lumen, the opening in that pipe is much, much smaller, and obviously the blood flow through that vessel is going to be constrained. Intimal hyperplasia is actually not a disease. It's something that is caused by physicians and surgeons doing procedures to keep your heart working for a bit longer. So if they do a bypass, you're in good shape immediately. And within a, a few months, you may feel like your old self. But that, those grafts fail, and they fail because of this process of intimal hyperplasia. If they do angioplasty, they put a catheter into your heart, put a stent, looks like a little cylinder of chicken wire that opens up by a balloon, can hold that clogged artery open. But they too fail, sometimes within months, due to the same process. The same thing can happen in the large vessels that take blood to your brain, the carotid arteries. They can be opened up, but within months or years, they start to occlude by this process. Protandum blocked the process. It didn't stop the disease because it wasn't present during that. But in, in isolated organ culture, it could prevent this process of intimal hyperplasia. And finally, I want to remind you that the technology behind Protandum, the technology derived from these publications that led to these publications, is protected by three United States patents issued in 2007, 2008, and 2009. So this is not a run-of-the-mill product off the shelf. This is something that is very different. Its bedrock is mainstream solid science, mainstream solid patents protecting this product, and it's a powerful thing that you're selling and I hope all of you can take these tools and use them as you convince the people around you that Protandum is something they need. Thank you very much. Yeah.